Who does scripture say is actually the fourth person in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? After everything that has happened in the first two chapters, why does Nebuchadnezzar even send these helpful Jewish exiles into the fire? And why was this story both important to those living just a few centuries before Jesus and still important to all of us today? Well, we're going to explore these questions and more as we dive into this week's episode of Beyond the Words. Daniel is a book that kicks off with a lot of excitement. In the first chapter, Daniel's faithfulness to God by keeping his kosher diet impresses Nebuchadnezzar. In chapter 2, Daniel interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which no sorcerer, magician, or astrologer could figure out. And in both of these stories, it's profoundly clear that God is superior to Nebuchadnezzar and all of his gods. Even Nebuchadnezzar begins to recognize this. Well, now we're going to see another incredible event. A story that almost every child in Sunday school learned at some point. The story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. But here's the thing. Today, we're going way past the Sunday school version. Today, I want you to see the much deeper meaning of what's going on here. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to give you a lot of context and details that will really unpack this story. But here's my challenge. After we're done, I want you to go back and read it again. Read it again all the way through with all of this information in your mind and see how this opens your eyes to see this passage differently than ever before. This is actually the goal of Beyond the Words, to help you to do this. And so let's dive into Daniel chapter 3. In verse 1, Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, most likely, what Daniel's describing here is some form of stele, which is a stone tower like an obelisk that is carved into a figure and covered with inscriptions. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that we are not specifically told that this is a statue of Nebuchadnezzar, but context suggests that it probably is made to look like him. You see, in chapter 2, as Daniel was interpreting the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that the head of gold on the statue represented him. So it seems that Nebuchadnezzar took him seriously and decided to form a golden statue of himself. And yet, while Nebuchadnezzar remembers this interpretation from Daniel, he seems to forget everything else about God that he learned at that time. And you'll understand what I mean later on. Whatever form this golden statue took, though, it was clearly massive and impressive. Daniel says that it was 60 cubits by 6 cubits, which is about 90 feet by 9 feet. And Daniel also tells us that it's made out of gold. This reference to massive amounts of gold shows us that there is also a deeper meaning going on in this story. If you've watched our previous videos, you might remember that the initial audience of Daniel's book was Jewish people living in the 2nd century BC. While the stories of Daniel may have been floating around for a long time, it wasn't until just a few hundred years before Jesus was born that they were compiled together. And this original Jewish audience that was reading Daniel is in a lot of trouble. They're under the power of a nation called the Seleucids, a nation that forbids them from practicing the Jewish faith, desecrates their temple, and attempts to Hellenize them, which means causing them to adopt Greek culture and giving up their Jewish culture. Daniel's mention of gold, as he describes this statue, would have reminded the second century Jewish audience of the source of their oppression. Gold was at the center of the Seleucid economy. It would have reminded the Jewish people of the material that was giving their oppressors so much power and wealth. Just as the use of gold in his statue is how Nebuchadnezzar demonstrates his power, it's also how the Seleucids demonstrated their power. But gold isn't the only part of this story that would have caught the attention of this Jewish audience. Later in verse 1, Daniel mentions the plain of Dora. This is a reference to the valley of Dora. The Dora Europas was a place of significant activity for Antiochus III and Antiochus IV, both Seleucid rulers. It was located along a major trade route and was the site of a temple to Zeus. So, 
Just as Nebuchadnezzar had put a highly visible false god in this region for people to worship, so too did the Seleucids. And just as the second century Jewish believers were being forced to decide whether or not they would surrender and worship these false gods, so too had Daniel's friends been forced to choose. Now, after this statue is erected, Nebuchadnezzar has all of his officials declare that everyone must come to worship this golden image. He then lists a variety of instruments that will play and says that once people hear these, they will be required to bow before this false god. But here's something interesting about the instruments. Nebuchadnezzar mentions the various instruments, and they all reflect a variety of social classes. For instance, the flute was used by peasants. The lyre would have been made of ivory and precious metals and only been owned by the wealthy. In other words, everyone was intended to worship Nebuchadnezzar and his statue. But this is where things begin to take a turn. Immediately after this decree is made, Daniel says that astrologers come to Nebuchadnezzar to accuse three of Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of refusing to abide by Nebuchadnezzar's command. In fact, the phrase accused is the Hebrew phrase akalu kartsehon, which literally means they ate bits off of them, which is just so much more brutal and graphic and explains why what these men are doing is so vicious. Right? But as we look deeper, we can actually understand why they're being so vicious to these men. You see, the word astrologers is also a reference to a group called the Chaldeans. The word refers to an Aramaic-speaking group of people in Babylon known for their work in astrology. Because they were so closely associated with this practice, eventually the terms Chaldean and astrologers became interchangeable. And the last time this group appeared in Daniel, they were threatened with death because they failed to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The same dream that Daniel eventually did interpret with the help of his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So ultimately, we're given the impression that the Chaldeans were humiliated before the king by these Hebrew captives. And this is their opportunity for vengeance. It's almost as if they say, you showed us up with the power of your God. But let's see how your God rescues you from this. Because the Chaldeans know that by telling Nebuchadnezzar that these men are being disobedient, he will have no choice but to execute them. Which is exactly what begins to unfold. Before that though, please take a moment to go down below and click the thumbs up and subscribe buttons if you're liking this video. If you're with us for the first time today, welcome. And if you've been with us before, then welcome back. By clicking those buttons, you help us to reach even more people like yourself and help them to understand scripture like never before and see it with an entirely new set of eyes. So please take a moment to click those buttons. Thank you so much for your support. And now let's hop back into the video. Okay, so after hearing from the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and presents them with these charges that are being leveled against them. He tells them that they must bow and worship this statue as soon as they hear the instruments play, lest they be thrown into a blazing furnace. But just as Daniel could not eat Nebuchadnezzar's food in chapter 1 because it went against the teachings of the Torah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can't obey Nebuchadnezzar's decree because they will be breaking God's law. They say, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Which is basically another way of saying, we will not break the first or the second commandments. You see, the first commandment is to have no other gods before the Lord. And the second is that they must not worship images of anything in heaven or on earth. And just like how in the last chapter, Daniel approached Nebuchadnezzar with promises to interpret his dream, despite the fact that God had given him no assurance that God would help him with this, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego remain faithful to the Lord without any assurance that God will save them from the faith that Nebuchadnezzar has in store for them. In both cases, all these men have to rely upon is their faith. And this is such a powerful reminder of what faith is. Faith is believing in God, not just when we have reason to believe God will help us. Faith is believing in God when we have no reason to believe that God will help us. We are faithful to God, not just because we think God will do what we want, 
but because we worship God. And no human circumstance will change that. I mean, let me ask you, are there some of you right now who feel like God's message to you in this moment is that you need to worship God even though you don't feel like you have any good reason to do so right now? Right? The, the way things are going, things are going wrong. Maybe God feels silent, but you just know that you need to be faithful because that's what these men are doing. And, and, and let's be honest, given what happens next, their faith must be incredibly strong. In his anger, Nebuchadnezzar commands that the fire in the furnace be made seven times hotter than usual. This is an Aramaic idiom that means that he has made the fire as hot as it could possibly be. It is so hot that it incinerates the people who are throwing these men into the fire. Basically, Daniel wants us to understand that this is a situation in which there is no hope except for God. And Daniel actually includes some very small details to reinforce just how true that is. Right? He goes into detail describing the clothes that these men were wearing. He tells us that they were firmly bound. In other words, he wants us to know exactly what they look like going in. Because as soon as they are tossed in, everyone realizes that something is off. When Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fire, he sees that they are no longer bound. Later, Daniel tells us that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. In other words, the same fire that killed Nebuchadnezzar's men just for getting close to it doesn't even touch Daniel's friends. And Daniel actually tells us why. In verse 23, Daniel says, And these three men, firmly tied, fell down into the blazing furnace. And the, these words that Daniel uses here are very intentional. You see, the Hebrew word for fall down that is used here is Nepal. It's a word that is used to refer to one who falls down in worship and subservience. In fact, it's the same word that's used in verse 6 when Nebuchadnezzar decrees that everyone must fall down and worship his statue or else be thrown into the fire. But these three men don't fall down in worship to Nebuchadnezzar. They fall down into the fire. Their act of falling down into the fire is an act of worship to God. They don't worship the king who threatens them. They worship the God who they know will save them. And there's actually one more detail here that makes this especially clear. When Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace, he doesn't see three men. He sees four men. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Now, this is actually an Aramaic phrase used to refer to spiritual beings sent from God. It's saying that God has sent someone to watch over and to protect these men. But the phrase son of God is also a phrase in Hebrew. It's an idiom for God. Regardless, though, what Daniel's trying to tell us is that God was in the furnace with them. Whether it was in the form of an angel or if it was in the form of Jesus, right? Which as Christians is often our first instinct when we hear the phrase son of God. Or, or whether it's just God's presence that was so amazing that they could hardly even put it into words and describe it. The point was that God was there. No fire, no idol is a match for the Lord. In fact, in the closing verse of this chapter, Nebuchadnezzar himself even realizes this. He applauds their faith in the Lord. He himself decrees that God is supreme. And when you think about it, for the Jewish people living in the second century, hundreds of years later, people who are being forced to compromise their faith, people who are threatened and coerced into worshiping false gods, for them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are a reminder of what true faith looks like. They might feel hopeless, they might feel like they have no choices in life. But when faced with a hopeless situation and no reasonable choice for survival, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose to be faithful to the Lord. And the second century Jewish believers should too. In fact, maybe that's the lesson that the Lord's trying to show you and me today. Maybe you feel like it's not possible to truly be faithful to God right now. There's, there's too many outside pressures around you. Too many other things demanding your time or your money 
or your energy. There's too much at stake. And it feels like there's no way out without experiencing some harm, sacrificing something. Right? You might even be trying to find an excuse or a workaround because you just don't feel like you have any good options. But what God is saying to you through this chapter of Daniel right now is that you need to stay faithful to the Lord. Put your full trust in the Lord against all odds. Even without any assurances, trust in the Lord. And so I want to end by praying for you to be able to do just that. Now, after the prayer, make sure to stick around because I'm going to share with you what video you should definitely watch next in this series on Daniel and Revelation. But right now, let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you for this moment in Scripture, for the incredible faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, for the fact that they trusted you even though they had nothing to go on, no promise, no assurance, just faith. And Lord, we ask that you will help us to have that kind of faith. You know what each person listening is facing right now. Hear our prayers, Lord. Grow our faith. Help us to be bold even when there's no hope. Because we know that our true hope is in you. In our Savior and in our Messiah, Jesus. And so it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. This video is just one in a series we're doing on Daniel and Revelation. So take a moment right now and click this link right here, which will take you to the next video that you should watch in this series. And again, thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.